Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad you're here. Let's, uh, let's have another prayer before we get started today. Sound good? Jesus, fill us with your spirit. Thank you for being here with us. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice, we pray. Amen. Have you ever needed an answer to a question, to a, a situation, to a problem, but you were afraid of the answer that you were going to get? Has that ever happened to anybody? All the time. Yeah. I want to tell you about a time when I was nervous about the answer to a question that I had asked. And I want to talk to you about a man in the Bible who was nervous about the things God was telling him. Celesta and I had known each other for a couple of years before we started dating. We had not spent very much time together, but we were friends. Uh, we knew each other. We worked together on projects. She was the director of the Pathfinder Club. I was on staff at the Pathfinder Club. Um, we spent time together. During this time, we began to go running together in the evenings. Now, I hate running, but I knew that Celesta was interested in running, and I knew that I needed exercise, so I started running to be closer to Celesta. Now, she knew that I was interested in her, but I did not know uh, whether or not she was interested in me at all. She was very good at maintaining a level of professionalism that made me wonder whether she was enjoying my company or tolerating my, my presence. Uh, but even if I didn't know that she was interested, I knew I was interested, so I just kept hanging around. I took advantage of opportunities to do the same thing she was doing and spend more time with her. And eventually, other people began to notice that we were spending time together. Now, this was not ultra problematic, but I knew that if I was hearing about it, uh, certainly Celesta probably was, or, or she soon would, and that meant that if I was going to make a move and declare my interest, I should probably do it before it was forced upon me by the situation. One day we went running like we normally did, and we stopped for a break and began to talk. And as she and I talked, I began talking to myself. Should I say anything? Is now, is now the time for this? It, it could wait, and it could wait till another day. Didn't, didn't have to be today. But for some reason or another, I decided that it was going to be today, and I was just going to come out and say it. Now, I've got to say, I was nervous. I knew I needed an answer to this question. I knew I was going to have to do this sooner or later, and it might as well be sooner, given the circumstances. I knew that these kinds of things come with an inherent level of risk, and we all just have to accept that and move on. But nevertheless, when it came right down to it, I was nervous about asking the question. I knew that the moment I did, the balance of the relationship would inevitably change, and I was not sure that those changes were going to be good. I needed the answer, but I was anxious about it. These kinds of situations happen all the time in everyday life. People are nervous about going to the doctor because they don't want to hear bad news or inconvenient news. Uh, people are nervous to ask a question in public because they're afraid that they'll be looked down upon like they should have already known that answer, and so they stay quiet. And this, by the way, is why I was not very good in math class because uh, I didn't ask the questions I needed to ask. Some people might be even afraid to hear the answers that God needs to give them about certain things in their life. We know that God's answers mean business, and sometimes we trick ourselves into feeling better off not knowing what God's answers are. Can anybody resonate with me? Yeah, yeah. Today I want to explore that idea, specifically the idea of being afraid of what God has to say. And I want to present to you the, uh, the idea that being afraid is not necessary when it comes to God and his answers. 
My suspicion is that everybody has, has kind of avoided the question, avoided the, the problem, avoided the answer with God at one time or another. I know that I certainly have. And there's even a Bible story that provides an example for us of someone in history who has been hesitant about what God was saying to them. Go with me to the book of Judges, chapter 6, and we will read together the story of a, uh, of a man uh, whose life was full of apprehension. Judges, chapter 6. This is the story of Gideon. And as we read this together, I want you to pay attention to Gideon's fears. Gideon was afraid of his family. Uh, Gideon was afraid of his neighbors. And Gideon was afraid of what God had to say to him. The context here in Gideon's life is that Israel has been suffering under continual raids and invasions that have pushed the people to the edge. All their food is getting stolen. And so we find Gideon hiding some of his food, threshing the grain in a a vineyard. Let's start in verse 11 of chapter 6. Here's what it says. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizarite while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you. I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who who speaks with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. And that's our introduction to Gideon. A man who God says is a mighty and, and brave man, but one who is also kind of hiding in, in a wine press. A man who seems to be skeptical of the heavenly messenger, identified as the Lord himself in verse 14, and a man whose faith has definitely flagged. A man capable of mighty things, but one who definitely seems not to be living up to that assessment at the present moment. Gideon goes away from this encounter to prepare his test for the messenger, his offering, and when he returns, verse 20 happens. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes, and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that it was the angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizarites. And after this, Gideon believed. But the Lord was not done with Gideon. He didn't just come to restore the faith of one of of his people. No, he he had plans And in verse 25, he begins to outline those plans for Gideon. That night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. 
and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering, with the wood of the asher that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Now this is a bold ask. But then again, Gideon is a mighty man of valor. And he does exactly what the Lord asks him to do. He boldly marches up at noon and cuts down the Asherah pole and kills the bull for sacrifice right there in front of everyone without hesitation, right? Not, not quite, right? That's not exactly the way it went down, was it? Let's be clear. Gideon did do exactly what God asked him to do. But let's, let's make no mistake that the Bible is also clear that he went at night because he was too afraid of what people would think to, to do this thing openly. Gideon knew what the Lord wanted him to do. He was just a little afraid to do it. But Gideon's story isn't over. When people wake up in the morning and, and go out to see that their gods have been torn down and lit on fire, they're pretty angry. They soon figure out that it was Gideon, and they call for, call for his head, so to speak. But they don't get it. His father has some, some wise words and some threatening words to say in verse 31 when people come after his son. He says, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for his own self, because his altar has been broken down. And I guess that worked, because Gideon gets off the hook. Soon, in fact, something else begins to happen in the region. Verse 33 starts it for us. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet. And the Abizarites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. Now Gideon is beginning to sound like a mighty man of valor. The Spirit of the Lord comes on him, and he begins to raise an army to go out and fight against the invaders. But let's continue the story in verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, Behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, oh, Let not your anger burn against me. Let, let me speak just once more, please. Let me just test once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground there was dew. So close, Gideon. So close. Have a little faith, Gideon. God has already proven himself in this situation. Everything is going according to plan. But I don't want to be too hard on Gideon here. To be fair, it's understandable why Gideon was a little afraid, I guess. That doesn't excuse his lack of faith. But I can understand, in some sense, the, the fear, humanly speaking. Gideon wants more signs, and God, meeting him where he was, gives him another sign. But then fear strikes again, and Gideon feels like that sign wasn't good enough, and he, he needs another sign. And so he asks God for the sign, and God gives him another sign. God is good. God is very patient. And he knew what Gideon needed, and it worked. And you know the rest of the story. Gideon does become Israel's deliverer. With 300 men, God uses Gideon to defeat an army that seemingly, hopelessly outnumbers them. 
And things go well in Israel for a little while because of this doubtful, scared, mighty man of valor. And I don't want to be too hard on Gideon because I know that I have acted like Gideon myself. But Gideon kind of reminds me of a bear in a story that I read recently. A man was visiting the country of Turkey, and he went to eat at a restaurant. While he was eating, another man showed up outside the restaurant with a bear on a leash. Um, and the bear had been trained to do tricks, and the man pulled out a tambourine, and he and the bear began their routine. And soon people began to gather around and watch what the bear could do. And they, they liked the routine. And so when it was done, the man began to pass around the tambourine and they put, they put money in it. Um, and while this was happening, a scruffy dog ran into the mix and began to accost the bear. Now the bear had a muzzle on. Um, the bear didn't have any claws. And when the dog began to bark at the bear, it didn't even resist it just immediately began to, to cower away from the dog and, and just let itself get barked at. And you know, in, in that bear's situation, I guess it's reasonable. No teeth, no claws, no defense, apparently no self-confidence. But, that, but at the same time, I, I can't help thinking, but like, you're a bear. Just stand up and growl once at that little dog. Roll over and lay on it. I don't care. It'll leave you alone after that. You're a bear for goodness sakes. But the bear acted as if it had forgotten the power, had forgotten the potential that it really had. Just as Gideon took far too little stock of the power that he really had with God on his side. God called him a mighty man of valor, but he had forgotten an idea that he knew, um, an idea that was later expressed in Romans 4.17, namely that God calls into existence the things that do not exist. And that's true in the literal sense, in that God calls things like worlds and stars and light itself into being when it formerly did not exist. But it's also true in a calling kind of sense. Gideon did not rightly understand that if God calls you to do something, he is going to provide you with all the power necessary to make that thing a reality. And further, if God calls you something, then you are that thing, because God knows what he's talking about. Gideon was a mighty man of valor because God said that he was. And if you're thinking that the point of this sermon is to remind us that God is with us and that like Gideon, he can do mighty things with us too, like be encouraged, like that, that kind of thing, I'll admit you can, you can get that out of what I'm saying. And I would further say it would be good to remember those things because they are true. But what I really want to draw your attention to today is, is more specific than that. Gideon had trouble receiving God's answers and following God's directions. He had faith, and he is remembered as a man of faith because he did do big things by God's power, and he trusted God mostly eventually. Gideon was a mighty man of valor, make no mistake. But the reality of Gideon's life is that he did not understand who he was dealing with when he was dealing with God, and consequently he had trouble believing God's words and receiving his instructions. He did not completely feel that God was worth trusting, or he would have trusted him. The real point of the sermon today is to draw your attention to God, not to Gideon. And I want you to ask yourself, in that light, do you really understand who you're dealing with when you deal with God? And now if your immediate response is, well, no, duh, can anyone? I hear what you're saying, and, and to a point you're correct, but you're missing the point also. What I'm really asking is this. Do you have trouble believing God's words? Do you have trouble receiving God's instructions? When you look at the Bible, are there things that he asks you to do as a Christian that you are afraid to do or that you purposely do not do because those things are hard to do? Are there things that you believe you should do but that you don't do because they are uncomfortable to do? And if you acknowledge 
that these things really come from God, why are you afraid? I want to submit to you that the reason you are afraid is because you, like Gideon and like myself, have trouble trusting God because we do not understand him rightly. And we do not always keep a good picture of him in our heads. Consequently, we don't trust him. Part of my story is that for a long time, I thought about God as a person in heaven who was up there really just waiting to punish me if I didn't do things well enough. And I was always worried about whether or not I was following his will. I don't know if you can resonate with my experience. It's, it, that's irrelevant. That's, that's the way I felt about God. I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about what that was like. Spoiler alert, it was the worst. Not everything that I'm going to say is probably in the right order, but this will give you a sense. Now, I, I didn't want to violate God's will. I wanted to keep his will. Uh, but I also felt like he was just waiting for me to, to do things wrong. Now, I knew theologically that if I did anything right at all, it was because God was helping me do it, God was doing it in me. But that did not stop me from functionally thinking, believing, behaving like I was doing it all by myself, like God was, was exacting that out of me. I have felt like God was, was pushing, 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 pushing. And when that is your view of God, you don't end up liking him very much. The love of God becomes theoretical because you know that it should exist because this is true, isn't it? But you don't feel like you're experiencing his love and you don't feel very much love for God yourself, by the way, either. You're, you're just trudging uphill hoping to see Jesus smile at you, but very seldom feeling like he does. Gideon misunderstood God by thinking that God had abandoned him, and consequently, Gideon did not trust God. I misunderstood God by thinking that God was pushy, unhelpful. God was exacting. Um, I was often confused about what I should do, and I did not feel like God was giving me any help at all. Um, and all the while, he was going to punish me for not doing things right. And so I did not trust God, though I thought that I did. I thought that I did. But I've realized that who I was really trusting was myself, and I was really seeking approval from, from other people. But that is a story for another time. I did not trust God because I did not understand him, and I did not understand myself. I did not understand the Bible. I did not understand it even got so bad that I would read things in the Bible about God's love, about how he thinks about people, and they wouldn't make any sense, not because they were hard to understand, but because I did not know how they could apply to me. I did not know how they could be true in my experience. My framework was so alien and so rigid that God's word, I couldn't figure out how it could apply to me. I wasn't sure if I was good enough in his eyes for it to apply to me. I wondered if the idea expressed in Isaiah 59, 2 was how God was thinking about my life. Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. I wanted to go to heaven. I thought I would probably go to heaven. But at the same time, I was always wrestling back and forth with this. Was I in the kingdom or was I out of the kingdom? Somebody tell me already. Oh, I sinned. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm still in God's kingdom. Oh, I've asked for forgiveness. I'm safe. Oh, I've, sin I've sinned again. Oh, I've asked for forgiveness. I'm safe. And it was exhausting. And that's how it went for me. Until little by little, God was able to to break through a little bit. He was able to show me a, a better way. It's, it, uh, it's been a long process. And like everyone, I expect, I am still growing in the understanding that he has given me. 
but he helped me to look at things in the Bible. He, he found things in there that he knew that I couldn't reject. And then he showed them to me and he said, see, this applies to you. And I said, well, that's interesting. If that's true, then something else in here is true. He showed me that he did still want to listen to me, that I wasn't on my own, that he really was willing to help me understand this whole thing instead of just looking down from heaven, uh, waiting to strike me with lightning. And when I began to see that picture of God, I began to have hope. And eventually I came to see that he is a beautiful person worth following. Now, I say all of this to you to highlight the following. When you struggle to follow something in the Bible, when you are afraid to do things God's way because you don't know how that is going to turn out, uh, there, there is no need for the struggle because God is worthy of your trust. I have looked at God like he was exacting things from me when I followed what he said in the Bible, but he has helped me begin to see a picture of him that encourages me to follow instead of intimidating me into following. And I want you to be encouraged also. Because the picture that the Bible paints of this scenario, of, of how God thinks about us, of how God looks at us, is, is a picture of a God who should be taken seriously and not ignored. A picture where we do still need to repent when we do things wrong, one where the law is important, but also one where the same God that, that knows all of those things isn't sitting in the clouds ready to, th to throw down lightning bolts if you don't jump as high as he wants. The picture that the Bible really presents is one of a loving father, who is really there to help you do everything that he has asked you to do. And one who genuinely wants you to succeed more than you want you to succeed. One whose commands are meant to deliver you into a better life. This past week at, at prayer meeting, we read the parable of the good father. Um, in Luke 15, God is portrayed as a father whose son runs away from him taking his share of the family fortune, only to waste it all in a foreign country. Pretty soon he wants to come home. The only problem is he doesn't know if the father is, is actually going to receive him back. Maybe, maybe as a servant, probably as a servant. I'll go, I'll go as a servant, but definitely not as a son. He does not know how the father is going to receive him. But as he's on the way home, Walking up the road, the father sees him, and this is what the Bible says about it in Luke 15. You can read it in verse 20 if you want to. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt intense anger and hatred at the child. Is that what it says? No, that isn't what it says. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, the interesting thing about the man in, in the parable, the, the culture in which Jesus was telling this parable, is that old men, men like this who have grown children, did not run. They don't. It is disgraceful to run. There, in, in that culture, even to this day, old men do not run. There are stories of men who needed to evacuate because of a building was coming down or, or something, and they literally died instead of running to get away from the danger. That is how disgraceful it is to run. And here we see the most important person in the universe not feeling anger and hatred towards this kid who's wasted all of his money but throwing all of his own dignity aside to run and embrace him and kiss him. And the son says to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, 
to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and hate this kid again because he is the worst. No, that isn't what it says. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and I still wish he was dead. No, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the picture of God that comes from Jesus himself. So if you're not going to believe anything else, you might as well believe that. It comes from an authoritative place. This is a picture of a father who is waiting to receive us, not reject us. Even though we've messed up and wasted his time and money, And if you are thinking, like I used to, that God will not receive you because of this or that element of your life, you are wrong, friends. You're wrong. You have been told a lie. The devil has told you this lie to keep you away from from the love that God really offers. To keep you misunderstanding who God really is. You do not clean yourself up before coming to the Father. You go to the Father, and he cleans you up. If you want to come to him, he receives you first, just like this Father in the story, and he works to give you everything you need for life and godliness. Put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, give him my best robe, put it on him. Everything you need, the Father gives you. You can't clean yourself up. The evidence is all there in black and white or or red and white, depending on your translation. The father is looking for the son and sees him while he is still a long way off, number one. When the father sees the son, instead of feeling anger, he feels compassion for the son. He throws all dignity aside and runs to the son to welcome him back into the family. Three, he hugs and kisses the son. Four, and then after all of this, For the first time, the son speaks. And and five, in this story, the father is is never the one that offers any word of condemnation at all. The, uh, The older brother is. The other people in the story, not God, but the people, offer the condemnation. The father wants the son, and he is happy when he comes home. And he wants you to know that if you are in any way remotely interested, if, you have, if you're even remotely in the vicinity of his house, he is looking for you. And he is, he is coming to you while you are still a long way off. And if that story isn't good enough for you, look at the, the two previous stories, the story of the lost sheep, the, the story of the lost coin. Now the sheep knows that it's lost, but it doesn't know the way home. And the shepherd says, well, forget that sheep. We don't like him anyway. I hope he dies. No. The shepherd goes out and finds the sheep. And he picks up the sheep. And he carries the sheep home. The sheep knew it was lost. It didn't know the way home. The coin, on the other hand, doesn't even know it's lost. And the woman in in the story says, ah, it doesn't matter. I still have nine other coins. No. It's being looked for. The son knew he was lost. He knew the way home. He was accepted. The sheep knew it was lost. It did not know the way home. It was still accepted. And the coin didn't even know it was lost. And the father still wanted it back. No matter where you are, God is looking for you. Not to condemn you, but to bring you home. Romans says there is no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He is there ready to find and accept you, ready to help you, ready to look for you for when you'll listen to him, just just waiting for you to come home. This is the picture of God that the Bible presents to us. And if there is another picture of God that is more prominent in your mind than this one, 
if there is no real place for this picture of God, practically, in reality, be honest with yourself, if there is no real place for this picture of God in your framework, may I humbly suggest you need to throw away the picture that you have and get a different one. This is the picture of God from the man himself. Respectfully, friends, I do not care about the the castle that you have built for yourself that says this is the way that God is. What you need to do is make sure that thing is square with what the Bible says. Ellen White has this to say in the book Steps to Christ on page 26. When talking about repentance, she says, Just here is a point on which many may err, and hence they fail of receiving the help that Christ desires to give them. They think that they cannot come to Christ unless they first repent, and that repentance prepares uh, prepares for the forgiveness of their sins. It is true that repentance does precede the forgiveness of sins. For it is only the broken and contrite heart that will feel the need of a Savior. But must the sinner wait until he has repented before he can come to Jesus? Is repentance to be made an obstacle between the sinner and the Savior? The Bible does not teach that the sinner must repent before he can heed the invitation of Christ, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to genuine repentance. And I did not understand that for a really long time. Jesus will take you wherever you are, no matter what you have done and no matter what you are doing. If you are interested in him, just start coming. It does not matter if you're unsure of things. You're going to get the details wrong. It's not your responsibility. He will sort out the details. Get closer to him and find out who he really is. And I invite you to do that today. Today, you have an opportunity to do this. Jesus invites you today, now, to do this. No matter where you are. Open your heart to him and let him show himself to you. Give him a chance. And especially to those of you who who may be sitting here, maybe not, to whom this picture of God seemed alien, I especially encourage you to ask yourself the question, what if that is true? And let that into your heart. This is the picture of God that we are given in the Bible. This is what he's really about. You do not need to be afraid of the things that he asks us, bringing this all the way back around. When, when you see something in the Bible and you're like, eee, golly, that is just, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pretend I never read that. You don't have to be afraid. This is the God that you are rejecting when you do that. Think about this picture of God, this person that God is. He is worthy of your trust. Give him a chance. Do the things that he asks. He is not going to lead you astray. C.S. Lewis puts it very well when he says, there are far, far better things ahead than any that we leave behind. God is not going to take anything away from you that would be good for you to have in the long run. And he is going to give you better things in the exchange than the things that you give up. Today, I invite you to entertain that notion. Give God a chance to really prove to you who he is. Trust him. Trust him. He is worth trusting. Let's pray. God, I know that it took you a really long time 
to break through my crusty framework. And you're still breaking it down. I got the details wrong. Help me, Jesus, to keep getting the details right in you. Help all of us, Lord, to get the details right, to open our hearts to this picture of you, the picture that you yourself gave us. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Help us come to you and lay our burdens down. Thank you for doing that. I pray in your name.